All right, folks, we are in Huntsville, Alabama today. This is my hometown, okay? Huntsville is a town located in North Alabama, about 100 miles south of Nashville and about 100 miles north of Birmingham, Alabama. So that should give most of y'all a little bit of a reference point of where we're from. So today specifically, we're in South Huntsville in the uh, area that we call Jones Valley, okay? The crime we're going to discuss today took place in 1998. At that time, Jones Valley was uh, one of the better, I guess it was a solid middle class neighborhood, but it was, uh, you know, people, people in the area would always uh, refer to Jones Valley as where the rich folk live, stuff like that, you know, but there are some nice neighborhoods over here like that, but it's mainly just a good solid middle class neighborhood. But anyhow, Gerald and Cynthia Franklin chose to raise their family here, okay? They came to Huntsville, they had five children. Sarah was 14, Stacy was 11, Timothy was eight, and Christopher was six. Their eldest son, who's the topic of today, was Jeffrey Franklin. He was 17 years old. Jeff Franklin attended Grissom High School and I believe it was his senior year when this stuff happened. But I talked to several of his uh, classmates online. I actually used the neighborhood app and I uh, got a huge response, huge feedback from locals here. And everyone that spoke of Jeffrey up until this incident or a year or two before the incident had only positive things to say about him. Okay, nobody had anything negative to say about Jeff at all. But around his like sophomore year, Jeff turned really dark and started listening to uh, the real heavy metal and you know, y'all know y'all know the type. I mean, everybody's known people like this. People call them gothic and people say, oh, they're into Satan, satanic stuff and stuff like that. But that's the, that's the path Jeff was on. And uh, he took it, he took it full bore. He went all the way and uh, got into the heavy satanic, satanic stuff. He had a satanic Bible, satanic writing, satanic music, CDs and tapes and stuff like that. And uh, he definitely uh, wasn't afraid of showing everybody that he was part of that lifestyle. But uh, this area of Huntsville was the type of neighborhood where people left their bicycles in the front yard, left their windows unlocked, left their doors open. Uh, I've lived here all my life. And I've, I can tell you that uh, I have never heard of another story that impacted a community as much as this story did. So I'm going to get on with it. I do want to add in real quick that Jeff was born in Huntsville, Alabama in 1980. These events took place on uh, March the 10th of 98. Jeff was still 17 years old. He would have turned 18 that year. And uh, on this day we're discussing, uh, it was a very cold day. On March the 10th, the time had not changed yet. So at around 5 o'clock when these events started taking place, it was already getting pretty dark. It was a very, very uh, overcast day, very windy. It was in the low 30s uh, that evening when it happened, and that morning it actually was in the high 20s, and it actually snowed uh, a little bit that day. So at around 5 p.m., one of Sarah Franklin's friends comes to visit, one of her girlfriends, okay? She comes to the house, and front door is locked. She goes around the side gate, opens that gate up, goes to the back door. You know, I mean, we all had friends coming up. This would be standard practice at a lot of my friends' house. You know, we just knock on the door real quick and walk in. We, we knew them that well, and I'm sure these, these people knew each other that well. Well, she went to the back door, and as soon as she rounded the corner of the gate to go into the back side of the garage there, there was Jeffrey standing. All she remembers seeing is uh, Jeff standing there covered in blood looking at her. She runs off and goes home and calls the Huntsville Police Department. Huntsville Police, Huntsville Police originally received the, the call as a possible assault. Um, the first officer that arrived on the scene uh, drove past the house, the Franklin house, and went to the house of the phone call that, that was uh, received. And um, when he drove by, he made a mental note of the cars and stuff that were uh, in, the neighbor, in the driveway, parked on the street and stuff like that. And he noticed the blue Geo Metro parked in the driveway, okay? So he goes down to the house and takes the report on the actual complaint. In the meantime, another officer arrives at the house. The first responding officer comes back to the house also. So now you have two officers there at the house. I'm not trying to get confused and I'm trying to just, I'm speaking from the brain here. I'm not reading anything. I'm just 
speaking from memory and what I know. But both officers arrive back at the house and the first officer notices that the Blue Geo Metro is now gone. From what I was told, the person who was there, that at that point they issued a bolo, a be on the lookout, for the Blue Geo Metro. So both officers are there at the house. The bolo has been, been sent out. They go to the front door. The front door is locked. Okay, obviously we know that because the friend already tried to get in the front door. They go the same route the friend did. They walk to the south end of the house. There's a uh, fence there. They go through the fence. They turn up the back side of the house, go in, start to go inside the uh, garage door, and they notice right in the threshold of the door, there's a child laying right there. Bad wounds to the child, uh, to the child's head, to the neck. And uh, from what I was told, they couldn't even tell if it was a boy or a girl. So I'm not gonna say who was laying there because uh, the people I spoke with did not know who it was laying there. And I've read some stuff online and I can't find a fact of who was laying there, but one of the children was laying there. So they actually had to step over that child to breach the threshold to get into the back side of the garage to go into the house. As soon as the uh, officer stepped over that body they realized the scene was much more serious than they first had thought. So they, radio they radioed it in and uh, whatever the police conversation is to, uh, in other words, we got major trouble, send ambulances, whatever they said to him, I don't know, but it basically was get everybody here, we got a major situation. So they enter the house through the garage. There's one body laying there, of course. They step over that. They go up actually into the, into the end of the dining room there. And as soon as they enter the dining room, they see another small child laying there. Same type of wounds. Wounds to the head, wounds to the neck, bleeding profusely. Um, a small child. I don't know exactly which child it was, but there was a small child laying right there on the ground. And they had to walk around that child and they entered into the living room portion where the dining room would reach the living room there. Upon entering that area of the, of the living room, they then could see the front door of the home. They noticed laying right in front, of, in, in front of the door there that Gerald Franklin was laying on the ground in a massive pool of blood. That was the emphasis that was told to me. The huge pool of blood was laying there, he was laying in. So I'm not going to get any more graphic than that, okay, that's graphic enough. They then turned out of the living room and went up towards the up towards the hallway area, going into the bedrooms, and right there around the corner laid the next child. Now from what I was told, they did know that that child there was Christopher, from what I was told. I cannot say that's a fact, but I have read it in two or three places and I was told firsthand that that was Christopher laying there. They then enter the hallway and they go up to the front first left bedroom there in the hallway, which is Jeffrey's bedroom. Upon entering that bedroom, they see Cynthia laying in the floor in the fetal position, bleeding from the chest and the face and the head. So at this point, the children have been rushed to the hospital. Uh, the Huntsville Hospital spokesperson says that the injuries sustained to the kids were from a large blunt object or an ax. That's what she said at that time. And uh, at that time, Cynthia and Gerald, the parents, were both pronounced dead at the scene. But all the kids were still alive, but in very critical, very critical condition. So 11-year-old Stacy, the other, the other child, was not there at the time of the attack. She was at a dance class. Okay, lucky her, right? Horrible situation. She arrives back at the house in the midst of all the turmoil and they quickly rush her to Huntsville Hospital to be with her family that has survived. When she gets there, she's met by a spokesperson and a grief counselor or something like that, and, and she's taken care of the best possible way. So at that time, around that same time, a security guard at Ditto Landing, which is a local marina here on South Parkway, right by Jones Valley, notices a blue Geo Metro parked down near the water and notices a shirtless teenage boy in the water, splashing water everywhere, cleaning off like he's taking a bath in the water. So immediately after he knows he's been spotted washing off in the water, he jumps back in his car and he heads over to Green Cove Road and he heads toward Memorial Parkway, okay? He's trying to get away. He knows he's been spotted. I think he knows the gig is up. He runs up on Green Cove Road at Memorial Parkway intersection. 
And that's where he encounters his first police officer. Jeffrey is headed north on the parkway, turns north off of Green Cove, and the cop follows him. The cop recognizes the car from the Bolo. And I don't know all of the exact roads they turned on, but they went on about a 20 to 25 minute chase all over Jones Valley. I do know at some point they got back on uh, Bailey Cove Road and they were heading northbound, which is away from Jeffrey's house. And up at the corner of Bailey Cove and Weatherly, there's a Presbyterian church there and Jeff ran a police officer off the road and it popped all of his tires and the cop was uh, left immobile. He couldn't move or anything. It's not funny. Jeff turns to the west on, we on Weatherly Road and he heads up to Edgehill Drive. When they get to Edgehill Drive, which was a right turn off of Weatherly for Jeffrey there, um, he had to turn back north again onto Edgehill. It's, that road is a dead end. So Jeff, they're, they're flying through the neighborhood. I'm sure they're speeding excessively. When Jeff reaches the dead end, I don't think he knows that there is a dead end. And he ends up veering off to the right of the dead end and running into a fence. At that point, HPD releases one of their canines and they go after Jeff. I mean, the dog goes after Jeff, I'm sorry. And Jeff is actually seized uh, without incident with the dog from what, I, from what I've read. Before he can get in the back of the patrol car, old Jeff has to be Jeff, right? He starts flipping his tongue around and saying all kinds of, I don't know what the word is, uh, rude, lewd comments to some females, reporters and people that were around there. I guess the news was following, I don't know, but I know there's, there's actual video of him doing this. All of the uh, kids in this story, all the siblings did actually live. None of them did pass away. They all had very bad medical conditions. If what I understand, Christopher actually uh, was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Um, so I know it's bad enough, but at least the kids lived. I know Gerald and Cynthia passed away, but uh, at least nobody else was lost. So back at the, uh, back at the house, police find a uh, rat tail file a two pound sledgehammer, a hatchet, and a chef's knife. 16 year veteran of the HPD, Huntsville Police Department, says that in all of his career, he has never seen anything like this, and this is the worst scene he has ever been called to. The uh, investigator put the scene together, and he had determined that the first person to be killed was Cynthia, and he says that she was attacked with a uh, rat tail file and stabbed repeatedly and uh, many, many times and he, uh, he said that it was a very, very horrible scene in that bedroom. The next victim, Jeff decided to attack his 14-year-old sister, sister Sarah. He attacked her and clubbed her in the head with the back side, of, the back side and the front side of the hatchet and believed to be uh, cut with a chef's knife also. But definitely the hatchet, the front side and the back side. So it's a blunt side on one side and a blade on the other. Shortly after this, Gerald arrived home. Jeffrey knew what time he was gonna be there. Jeff waited behind the door. And when uh, Gerald came through the door, Jeff was standing behind the door with a two pound sledgehammer in his hand. And he came across the top of Gerald's head numerous times with the sledgehammer and uh, pretty much killed him instantly. Jeff then moved on to his younger siblings, uh, Timothy and Christopher. And all I'm gonna say about that is that he used a hatchet, both sides, the club side and the blade side on both of them. And I'll just say that uh, Christopher, uh, he, he, was, he was nearly decapitated, okay? He had very serious injuries to his neck and uh, he, had, he had suffered a, a very bad atta attack with the hatchet. Some of this stuff's hard to talk about, people. I'm sorry I stutter, I'm sorry that I fumbled my words, but I'm really trying to do this as gracefully and with as much respect as possible and still tell the story. So a private source in my investigation here tells me that Gerald and Cynthia were actually sleeping with their bedroom door locked. Jeff, uh, his mother, Cynthia, actually was hiding his drugs from him. He was on prescription, uh, Ritalin, Prozac, and Klonopin. Jeff had figured out a way to take the hinges off of the box that, he, that she hid the medicine in 
and he was going into the pill bottles and replacing the, the pills with saccharin tablets. So I believe from what I can decipher out of this is that, is that uh, he was, they were locking the doors to keep Jeff away from the pills. Cynthia's colleagues at Valley View Nursing Home said that Cynthia talked about this quite a bit with them at work. And they had even talked with the pastor and the pastor said that uh, this was a, he, he called it a passing phase and that Jeff would grow out of it. And he said, just don't be concerned about it. It wasn't any more, nothing more than that. But Jeff had been seeing a uh, psychiatrist, mental counselor or whatever you want to call it. And he was diagnosed with ADD and mild depression. And from what I understand, his Ritalin uh, dosage was massive. And Jeff later on actually admitted that he told the doctor he was abusing it. And the doctor upped his prescription. And Jeff even told him, he said, you can up it all you want. He said, I'm just gonna abuse it more and more. Jeff's uh, defense attorney, Robert Tutton, said that Jeff had been awake three days straight leading up to this incident. And that in fact, uh, it actually rendered him into a state of total psychosis is what he, is what he claimed. And he says that 12 days after Jeffrey's arrest, they tested his blood. And at that point, he still had a lethal dose of Ritalin in his bloodstream 12 days later. So when asked about the crimes, Jeffrey says that he was at the house when it happened, but he didn't do it. But there was some evil figure there that had horns sticking out of his head. He's the one that attacked the family. He's the one that did all the stuff, but Jeff didn't do it. So police actually found Jeff's journal and it uh, inside of it, you know, It, it, it described basically uh, satanic rituals and satanic sex acts and very, very deep, dark stuff. I'm not gonna go into all that too much. I am gonna actually read from a piece of paper here. I wanna read the, the actual inscription that Jeff wrote in the book leading up to the events, okay? And it says, I know dad will be home at this time and I will wait behind the door, behind the front door behind the hutch and I will hit him with a hammer. Mom will be out for a walk and when she comes back, I will have the radio playing loudly. I will call her into my room and ask her what's the agenda for the day, then I will kill her. I will strangle my little brother in his room, lure my older brother into his room and I will strangle him and my sister and then I will rape her and then finish her off. And even if they do catch me, I will plead insanity and fool the stupid judge and the prosecutors. Jeff never says uh, who told him to do the crimes, but he said that his parents were nagging him and that he had a direct connection to talk to the devil and that in that connection, the devil told him he should just do away with them. So investigators, upon searching the house, um, right where Cynthia was laying deceased, investigators uh, opened up a, or looked into the porthole of a speaker box laying right near Cynthia's head. And inside that speaker box, they found another uh, roll of papers and inside of that was more of the same stuff that was in his journal, dark writings and satanic stuff like that. When investigators brought in Jeff to do a interview with him, they had a diagram of the house drawn up. They handed him a pencil and said, we want you to show us the last place you saw your family at. Jeff grabbed the pencil and immediately started circling the house over and over and over and over again really, really hard, like crushing the graphite in the pencil. And he slammed the pencil down and started screaming crazy. And the investigator said that uh, at that point, they just ended the interview and that was the end of that. Jeff was arraigned in Madison County for attempted murder charges and murder charges. Jeff ended up pleading guilty to two, two charges of murder and three of attempted murder. Ultimately, he did this to avoid the death penalty. Judge Floyd Little sentenced Jeff to three consecutive life sentences. So Jeff's attorneys uh, stated that Jeff originally would have had a very, very strong insanity plea. But the fact that he decided to write everything in his journals uh, really messed that up and that uh, pleading guilty to the charges was gonna be the best chance for him at that point. So in Alabama, a person is eligible for parole after 15 years on a life sentence. Well, Jeff was sentenced to three of those, okay? So 45 years plus the 17 years 
of age he already had. Puts him around, what, 62? He could very well be released around in his early 60s. It's a pretty scary thought. So I actually spoke to a couple neighbors that live right there on Camelot. And uh, of course, a couple people don't want to speak. You know, I get it. I'm not trying to push anybody or get anybody's privacy or anything. But I did speak to a couple people that live right there nearby. And they said that uh, they'll never forget that day. They'll never forget the police tape. They'll never forget all of the police cars and everything that followed. That was uh, the worst thing they can ever remember happening in Huntsville. Jeff is now 41 years old. We were in the same grade, same everything in high school. I remember the night it happened. Me and my girlfriend were out riding around, which is my wife now. We were out riding around and my mom paged me. Y'all remember the old pagers? 911, which means call me now. So we stopped at the payphone. Nobody had cell phones back then. We stopped at the payphone, dropped that quarter. I called mama up. Mama said, be careful. Some guy on South Parkway has killed his family and they're chasing him. It was all over the news. So yeah, today Jeff is 41 years old and he is serving time in a Bullet Correctional Facility in Union Springs, Alabama. My personal opinion is I hope he never gets out. I hope he spends every day of his life locked up for what he did. That's just my opinion. And this information does come from a very, very good source and it might surprise a bunch of you. But Jeff has talked to his siblings. He is in, he is in communication with them. To what capacity, I don't know, but uh, they do speak. So with that, I also want to say to y'all, man, I'm right here. Jeff's house is just right right up that road right there. You can't see it. I'm going to turn the camera around and show you real quick. So this intersection here is Green Mountain Road and Belly Cove. That car going up the road there, if you go about one more street and turn right, that's Camelot Drive, right where that truck just turned? One more street up there and turn right, and that's Camelot Drive. And about a half mile down the left is where Jeff's house is. So yeah, we're going to end this part of the video now. And I'm going to go over to the cemetery. And uh, we'll actually finish up the video there. All right. Y'all stick around. All right, folks, we're here at Hampton Cove Cemetery in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest, I've already found the grave. It's right here on the side of the thing. You can't really miss it. I knew where it was. It was a general area. When I pulled up, I saw it. So, But to uh, talk briefly about uh, the parents, Cynthia and Gerald, or Jerry as everybody called, her, called him. Um, Cynthia's uh, co-workers at Valley View Nursing Home they had nothing but positive things to say about her. And as well, she had nothing but positive things to say about her family. The coworker that I spoke with online worked with her briefly, but she said, you know, looking back at this crime now, hindsight's 2020, it was so clear it was gonna happen, and now that it did happen, no one was surprised. But, you know, she felt kind of empty because she didn't ever say anything, and but who, who would have known, you know, who, who would have known this was ever gonna happen? You know, she reiterated to me several times that she knew Cynthia loved her family and always spoke very highly of them. And uh, even though she talked a lot of stuff about Jeffrey and things he was doing, she said that she didn't really have anything negative to say about him. It was just individual circumstances, you know, that she still loved her son. And uh, like I said, nobody ever knew this was going to happen, you know. So Gerald worked at VMIC on South Parkway, which is now Abacore Systems. And uh, I actually spoke to one of his coworkers also online, and he let me know that Jerry actually drove the Blue Geo Metro car to work uh, quite often. And just a few days leading up to this, the car was, the Blue Metro was there. Another coworker of Jerry's that I spoke to, I guess knew him more personally and said that he loved his family. He always spoke about him and he said he was one of those guys that if you mentioned his family to him, before you could finish your sentence, Jerry already started grinning. That he, he was just a, absolutely loved his family. And he actually wanted me to make sure that I put that in the video about Jerry because he knew it to be true and he, it was a fact and he wanted it put in here. So 
I did that. You know, upon doing this, I actually reached out to several resources to find information on this case. And uh, it came with mixed reviews, you know. A lot of people wanted me to do it, and some people didn't. And uh, it's something that I wanted to do now to kind of preserve in time with as many facts as humanly possible. Because as time goes on, these facts do slip, okay? And things change, as they already have. I talked to several people that were there the night that it happened and some of their stories were even mixed up, okay? So you have to do the best you can. And in this, uh, in this video, I'm being very vague on some things and very specific on the other ones. The specific ones are facts, okay? I went back to the court transcripts. I went back to everything. I, trust me, I've, I've, I've turned every rock and every stone to find every piece of information on this video that I can, okay? I am here at the grave now. I'm gonna spin the camera around and uh, show you all that real fast and we're going to end the video right there. All right, folks, so uh, this is going to wrap this video up. Here's the headstone right here. And uh, I cannot send enough prayers out to this family. This has been something that has affected me and my family. And, and we've known about this all, you know, like I said, since the day it happened. You know, we, we were here. I, I remember the day. And uh, I've spoken to many, many, many people, probably 100 people, okay? Everyone is very passionate about this story. And uh, so much so that I almost reconsidered doing this story and almost didn't do it. And I'm glad now that I did. Because I learned a lot of things I didn't know, okay? And I guarantee you that y'all watching this will learn something you didn't know. And that's the main reason why I did the video was to try to preserve any facts that might be lost in time. Prayers to the family, everlasting souls of uh, Gerald and Cynthia. Man, you know, visiting all these locations and then coming here where, where, where their remains lay. It's a powerful thing, man. You know, it, it's, it's a powerful thing and it hits, it hits me right in the heart, man. I can't imagine, uh, I can't imagine what this family has went through. Uh, and I hope that the siblings have moved on with their lives best they can. And I hope that they're uh, flourishing, you know. But anyway, so the people of Huntsville, to the family, anybody affected, uh, and to the everlasting souls, you know. Uh, I offer everyone my deepest condolences and my prayers you, you will be on my prayer list tonight and tomorrow night, okay? And that, you know, I mean, there's not enough. You know, this is one of those stories for me, like many others, but this one, this one being from my hometown, there's not enough that you can do or say. I ramble on trying to, and there's nothing else you can say. It's, it's you know, it's a horrible, tragic story. And uh, so anyways, with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you all for watching the video today. Thank y'all for uh, support of the channel. I appreciate it. And uh, y'all are already here. If you don't mind, go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you like the content. If you don't, then don't subscribe to it. I'm sorry. But if you like it, hit the like button also. Maybe leave me a comment. Tell me tell me a way this affected you. Tell me something you knew about it. And uh, I'd love to talk to y'all about this. We'll catch y'all on the next one, okay? Bye.